Welcome. My name is Lisa O'Halloran, District Trainer for 6270. We're so glad you're here. And a special happy birthday to Rotary. We are celebrating 117 years of service above self. So let's test those Zoom reactions and celebrate. Go ahead and share while I say thank you for all that you do both locally and globally for Rotary. How we meet, engage, and interact has certainly changed in the last two years. We have acquired new skills and opened ourselves to new and different ways of doing things. Tonight, our goal is to make an instant impact on the quality and effectiveness of district events. Our session's being co-presented and I'd like to introduce the team now. I'm Lisa O'Halloran, district trainer and an educator by trade. I'm joined by Don Griffin, who's district governor nominee of 6270 and our tech guru tonight. And finally, Kristen Bach, a body language expert who helps leaders and professionals skyrocket their personal charisma using psychology and the science of body language. How cool is that, right? Together, we will provide tips for developing a training content plan, selecting tools to engage participants, and presentation skills that will connect you to your audience. Even more simply, think content, tools, and delivery as the successful elements of a training session. We will also pull back the curtain, so to speak, to show you the behind the scenes of executing a training session. Our session is planned for 60 minutes. Please feel free to enter questions in the chat at any time. We will answer them as we can or at the end of the session. We will also stay open for an optional 15 minute Q&A after. As Don noted, we are recording. You will re each receive a follow-up email in the coming days with a link to the session recording and a list of the resources that we do share tonight. So let's use the Zoom chat function to warm up and get a little conversation going. I'm gonna ask you to take a minute and really think about training. Have you ever been asked to create a program or maybe you're going to serve as a panelist or present a session or facilitate a breakout? Think about what is your pain point, if you will, when you think about that training situation. So ponder that a moment and then in the chat, and please do share, tell us a little bit about concerns that you have in any of those scenarios or maybe what you might want to know more about tonight. So audience engagement is welcome tonight. What's on your mind? Ah, Carl, multiple presenters interacting gracefully. Love that. And we are hoping to demonstrate that for you tonight. Body language cues, absolutely. Making sure the content is interesting for everyone. Yes, Marta, excellent. Kelly, how to deal with someone that is a strong participant that overpowers others. Thank you for that, Kelly. Many more coming. What makes a presentation great? The ability to be comfortable without, okay, without umming a lot. Filler words, vocal fillers. And we'll talk about preparation and rehearsal as an important component to that. We're gonna talk about, I think almost every one of these, aren't we, Don and Kristen? Pretty exciting tonight. How to keep everyone engaged during hybrid. Ooh, Linda, that's excellent. Shout out to my fellow district trainer from 6440 tonight. Good to have you here. Uh, oh, guests that talk over others. Okay, thank you for that. Tech issues, Rob. I knew I could count on you all to bring your, bring your needs and your thoughts to our conversation tonight. This is absolutely fantastic. Varying levels, absolutely, another really important piece. How do I create a training format and where do I start? That's oh my almost goodness. A, that's almost an excellent segue for you, Lisa. It really is. It almost is an excellent segue. So I am going to get us rolling here. Are we sharing, Don? Yes, you are sharing. 
Fantastic. Thank you. So we're going to start with content, thinking about the content of our training session. There are really four key questions that we answer. Why are we doing the training? And my slide isn't advancing, so there we go. Here's Lisa doing a little, there we go, perfect. Who is your target audience? What do you want them to think or do? And how will you design the actual training? So those four questions are going to guide my portion of tonight's session. So first of all, we need to start with why. If you're familiar with Simon Sinek, thought leader, that is his big claim to fame, right? How do we think about what we're doing? What is that overall purpose, that overarching goal that we have? Are you, for example, are you teaching club leaders um, how to set goals, right? And enter them in my rotary. Are you desiring to increase membership through new membership models? Are you creating more diverse clubs through equity and inclusion programming? Our goal tonight is to make an instant impact on the quality and effectiveness of district training events. Next, analyze your audience. Right? What is the makeup? How many attendees will be there? These questions will help you determine the activities you use. If a small group, you can easily unmute and discuss. If larger, like tonight, leaning on Zoom chat and the raise hands feature is really valuable. What do we know about their why? Will they be excited to be there? Or could you have what I call check the box participants? If you're customizing training for a specific group, it may be helpful to survey them in advance to learn more about their knowledge and skill level. As an example, we do this for our incoming president-elects. This is how we determine the training plan for pets. That said, surveying is not always possible or practical, so we need to be ready for varying levels of interest, experience, and or knowledge. The chat warm-up I use to open the session is a technique you can use to gain insight in real time to know where your participants are at and what they want to know, and then to later connect the content to the participants throughout the session. This leads us to the what. We know our purpose and we have a sense of who will be attending, and now we need to determine what exactly we want the audience to think or do differently as a result of our training. So think actionable results here. I've borrowed the think do matrix from a presentation guru that I'm a fan of, Dr. Andrew Abela. And he says, first thing you think about, what, do you, what does your audience know, think, or do today, right? What is that present state? And how do you want that to change as a result? So we need to think about key takeaways we might hope for. Is it advocacy? Is it skill building? Is it execution of a project? Is it growing confidence? And then what challenges or obstacles might you encounter in creating buy-in? There is so much we could cover around training tonight, but we really had to be sensitive to the length of the session that we have available and frankly, cognitive load. We know that there's only so much that we can handle in one setting. Tonight, you know we have three key areas, content, tools, and presentation. And with actionable ideas within each topic, we're also looking for a dash of confidence building. So the final question is how? How will you design and structure the event? Let's consider the format that fits your why and your what. Are we disseminating need to know information? Are multiple voices and expertise valuable? Or are we educating, motivating, or inspiring to action? Or are we looking to collaborate? Perhaps a one rotary summit or a vibrant clubs workshop. So thinking about what the content is and what format that's going to play best in is critical at this point before we even start our development. Of note, most virtual sessions are an hour in duration. We can only handle so much. If that's the case, three presenting voices is really the maximum. Likely we have seen those panels where there are five or six members and they go unfortunately nowhere fast when the introduction ate up over half the time we had available. If you're in that situation, it's best to have the moderator make the brief in introductions so that you can get to the good stuff and keep the session moving. From an adult learning standpoint, 
Shifting gears every 15 minutes is best. This could be a different speaker, different topic, or some sort of activity. And keep in mind, the developer of the training doesn't necessarily need to be the presenter. A moderator with a subject matter expert can be a very effective approach. Next, we consider the roles. And my mouse jumped on me. One second here. There we go. Um, next, consider the roles, right? Um, who do we have in the room? We need the presenter, the expert, um, then the moderator, and then finally the Zoom operator. You're seeing we're going to be doing this a little bit differently this evening. Don is acting as that Zoom operator, but he's also going to become a presenter. And when we say Zoom operator, we're talking about the stage manager of the event. Then we have the moderator. I'm serving that role this evening. I'm also going to become a presenter. So someone earlier asked, what happens when you slide back and forth and how do you handle multiples? We're gonna pull back the curtain and show you that. Then we also have Kristen, who is our body language expert popping in. So we have all three of those roles at work. Ideally, dedicated roles, but you're gonna see us wear multiple hats tonight. And keep in mind, the more complex your plan, the greater the need for rehearsals. And finally, engagement. What is the desired engagement with your participants? A variety of methods appeal to different personality types. Extroverts eagerly jump in the chat. For some of you, that was easier to get started tonight. While a breakout or a Mentimeter poll honors the introverts who really appreciate more time or even anonymity. So here are four of my favorites. Zoom chat is quick and easy. We use this feature at the start of the session to get fast feedback and some interaction. Breakouts allow for deeper discussion and collaboration in smaller groups. Zoom reactions can provide quick check-ins with your audience. I use this one in my classes. I teach three hour long classes and I just, you heard what I just said about adult learning, right? So three hours is a long time. So sometimes it's simply give me a smiley face if you want to take a break or a thumbs up if you, you're good to keep going, right? Those check-ins. And then finally, Mentimeter is a way to poll. It also captures anonymous feedback that can easily be downloaded and shared. So there you have the why the who, the what, and the how of your content plan. Next, tech guru Don will share tips on how to select and use tools, followed by Kristen on delivery techniques. I'll be back with you to talk more about planning and rehearsing. Take it away, Don. Thank you, thank you Lisa. Um, so as Lisa talked about, she was the presenter talking about how the planning process. Tonight, I'm gonna to be talking about the, zoo, the role as a Zoom operator. And to borrow a, a, a cultural reference, we do want you to pay attention to the man behind the curtain. So with that said, I'm gonna start off my presentation with, with this. This is what mom thinks I do. This is what most Rotarians think I do. <laughs> well, I have a I have a surprise for you. This is what I do. As you can see in front of me, I've got my monitor with my webcam up on top. In front of me, I have a sheet of paper, with it, which is our, our plan. And off to off to my left here is a clock. So I can kind of keep track of where we are. Uh, you may also can see my iPad that I have over here on my right, because I'd like to using that to make sure that people are seeing what we want them to see. I don't always use it. If I can use it, I do. And of course, I have my tea just to keep me, my, me uh, hydrated during the presentation. So with that, I'll switch back to the uh, PowerPoint presentation and switch my video back to so it's me fa forward fa facing you guys. And so um, Lisa and I have talked about or used the phrase stage manager in reference to being a Zoom operator. One reason that we've adopted this phrase is the different tolerance levels for tech issues 
for in-person versus hybrid and virtual settings. Because participants can't see anyone attempting to fix a tech issue in a virtual hybrid setting, they become anxious faster. By thinking of the Zoom operator as an active team member in your event, you can maintain the momentum and decrease participant anxiety. As an active member of the team, you have some key responsibilities. Many of us Zoom operators have gotten used to muting the errant audio interruption. There is a little uh, used feature when scheduling a meeting that is an optional to request permission to unmute participants. Uh, and everybody got that uh, query when you came in. This option allows you to keep the momentum going by not waiting on the per participant to unmute their button. I will be using this feature during our Q&A time when Lisa or I call on a participant. In, in theater, a stage manager supports the organizations uh, across and organizes all the different teams across the day-to-day -day running of a production from rehearsals through performance and finishing the post show. I'm recording this uh, to my laptop right now. During the event, time is critical, which is why I have the plan and the clock in front of me. There are two perspectives of time for a training event. Runtime, how long should it take? Elapsed time, how long is it taking? The time captures, the plan captures the runtime. The clock helps me manage the, the runtime. Rehearsals are your key to effective time management. So how do you control what participants see? And as a Zoom operator, spotlighting is a valuable tool for managing what your participant sees. For each event, a spot will have its own spotlighting requirements. During our recent event with Rotary International Vice President Valerie Wafer last month, Lisa's video was spotlighted as she welcomed everybody and introduced Valerie. As Lisa was nearing the end of the, her introduction, I spotlighted Valerie. After Valerie started, I removed the spotlight of Lisa's video. After Valerie's presentation, I spotlighted Lisa and would add and remove other participants during the Q&A portion. Tonight, only one person is spotlighted during their presentation. When we transition to Q&A, I will spotlight the three of us and the participants who are asking questions. Again, using the request per permission to unmute participants and the raise hand reaction are helpful tools for keeping the conversation flowing. The third scenario for spotlighting is a panel discussion. For panel discussions, I will spotlight the moderator and all panelists. Now this may increase the amount of monitoring of background noise and unmuting that I may have to do during the session. However, it is a nice from the standpoint of, I don't have to keep panning the camera around as it were. Again, a detailed time manager plan and rehearsals are a key to effective use of spotlighting. Videos, they are a useful tool in training. Playing a video directly from YouTube or another website is dangerous for managing the user experience. When you share a video from a website, your computer must simultaneously download the video and upload it to the Zoom meeting. Sharing a video from a website increases the risk of frozen screens and lost audio for your participants. Another advantage of a plain video from your computer is avoiding unwanted advertising. I was at a memorial service last fall where they chose to stream a music video. About a third of the way through the song, an advertisement interrupted the playback. It did not only interrupt the moment, it threw off the flow for the next five minutes. So be, be, care, be aware of that. As I've mentioned in previous sessions, 
cueing the video minutes prior to when it needs to be played, and remembering to share your computer sound are important to maintaining the event flow. I'm going to sound like a little bit of like a broken record here, but a detailed time management plan and rehearsals are key to effective use of videos. Breakout rooms. Lisa talked about using breakouts as part of your event. It is important that you and your presenter agree on how breakout rooms are to be organized. The easiest option is to create the breakout rooms after the meeting has started. As you can see from this dialogue, that you can manually assign participants to a room. Lisa and I can speak from experience that manually assigning participants to a breakout room on the fly is stressful. This is the why that we why we allow Zoom to randomly assign participants to rooms. But you may be thinking, I want a facilitator in each room. Well, after you create the rooms, you can move participants to different rooms. So when you find a room with two or more facilitators, you move the individuals to the rooms missing a facilitator. It is easier to modify the rooms than it is to create them from scratch. After you've sent the participants to breakout rooms, you have two options to bring them back to your event, manually and automatic. There, uh, there's the option there as far as setting the time. Please note that when you use the countdown timer option, it will apply to either the manual or the auto close. So if that you may hit manual close and people don't come back because that countdown timer is running. So please remember to note if you intend to use the countdown timer in your time plan. Lastly, interactions. When we're presenting in person, we can rely on the room to help create and build the energy. With hybrid and virtual setting, the presenter needs to supply this energy. When the presenter is sharing their screen, they cannot see the reactions or the chat. As a Zoom operator, you can help them by commenting on the reactions or what has been written in the chat. As Lisa said, sometimes you want anonymous feedback that is not available through reactions and chat. Using a poll it provides this type of feedback. While Zoom has a polling functionality, we prefer to use Multimeter as, as our tool. The free version has all the functionality that we need, and we will have a Multimeter poll later in this evening. So, I've talked about the behind the scenes work of a Zoom operator to build energy and to maintain momentum. I'm gonna turn the session over to Kristen for her insights to help presenters on connecting uh, it, uh, with your participants. All right, well, okay. So as Don said, momentum, that is a big part of your delivery as part of presenting. You are setting the tone, the energy, the delivery. So I'm gonna jump in and because my background is in communication and nonverbals, I'm gonna share three body language basics with you. But I, you might be noticing that I have spiffy little uh, title there. I am using um, Ecamm. I have a MacBook Pro. So I have a software program that I use and I find this really helpful when I'm presenting. There is a cost to it. If you are not a MacBook Pro user, um, I believe the equivalent is OBS Studio. And I think that's free. Um, and I'm catching you off guard here, Don, but do you know anything about that? It, it, we, we can circle back, pin that and I will, um, yeah. Okay, so let's dive right in because a big part of what I want to share with you are some of these body language cues. So we know that we need to build trust when we're connecting with people virtually. So if you're leading a meeting, so I have a question for you and you can put your answer in the chat, but what part of a person's body do you notice first? So when you're first meeting someone, this can be, this is really more in person, but what are you noticing first about them? So I got to see what, uh, what you're saying in the chat. 
uh, okay, hands, face. Eyes, hands, yep. <laughs> okay. Face, eyes, eyes. Okay. And you are absolutely correct. What I want to point out, um, your, your brain is, of course, taking in that. I usually hear hair, teeth, smile, eyes, um, for sure. It's taking that in. But what your brain is actually scanning are hands. Hands are our trust indicators. So if you go back to like cave people days, we needed to know, is this person coming up over the horizon, a friend or a foe? And hands indicate that because we can, they show intent. I can have a rock, a spear, a weapon. There's no mistake that in this day, police officers say, put your hands up because that is showing your intent. So all of this to say, your brain cares a lot about it. It's like a software program running in the background and it's constantly scanning for them. What this means for you, why you need to know this, and I'm gonna just go to me right now here, is you need to keep your hands visible and expressive. We like to see hands. Our, our brain literally wants to see them. So when you are presenting, when you're on a call, you'll notice that there's enough of me in the frame here where you can see me. You can see my hands. I can use them. If you are someone who has a hard time speaking when your hands are like, if, if I tied your hands at your side and you couldn't speak, this is your happy day <laughs> because the reason we like hand gestures are, there's two reasons really. One, it allows you to, it lessens your cognitive load. It allows you to explain better. So you'll even see very young children starting to use their hands when they're explaining things because it makes it easier for you to explain. So it's for you, but it's also a gift to the other person. When you use your hands when you're, when you're speaking, it, it does two things. It allows the person to really hear and see and um, kind of visualize. So it's like underlining and bolding what you're what you're saying. So you see what I did there, right? If I say the same thing, it allows you to see and hear. It's like underlining and bolding. That's not quite as great as hear and see. It's like underlining and bolding. So it's important to use, um, keep your hands in the frame when you're presenting. It adds a little more charisma, a little more energy. It uh, makes you much more expressive. Uh, I wanna talk about fronting which is one of my favorite body language cues. This is the ultimate way to show nonverbal respect. Fronting is when you're fully facing someone when you are connecting. So there is research out there, uh, Frank Karamoff from the University of Brussels actually um, found out that we find people more trustworthy, open-minded and sympathetic when we can see more of their body which is why if I'm ever doing a presentation, I don't want anything blocking me like a podium or a desk. So you'll see, I'm actually standing here. I have a stand desk. It allows for more energy, but I don't want anything blocking me. So fronting is where you face your top, your torso and your, to your toes towards the other person. We often think that we front when we are not. Um, because our feet often are a little askew. So people actually, they've done studies where um, science of people did a study where they asked people at a conference, do you front when you're, when you're talking with them? 70% said, of course, yes, I front. They filmed the entire conference and interactions. They went back through, looked at the video footage, and they found it was closer to 30%. So we want to make sure that we are fully facing and engaging because people can feel when you're really paying attention. How this relates to the virtual world, world is we run into, and actually I should have you put in the chat, how many of you have multiple screens? So Don, Don's got a couple things, he's got his iPad, he's got his, his computer. Um, when you have multiple screens, this becomes much more difficult. So I highlight this for you to consider, because I don't have the answer, but if there's any way you can move the camera to whatever you need to be looking at, that really helps you connect. Because if, and you've probably been in meetings like I have too, where someone's looking at another screen and they're talking and they're not talking to you, and it's really distracting. We feel like they're multitasking or they're not really paying attention. So if you, if that's you and you have to look at things on a different screen, you want to at least acknowledge it. You want to um, say, 
that uh, I, I have some information on the screen. I'm going to be looking at a way, looking at it occasionally, but I am paying attention. All right. So consider that. Uh, I wish I had a great answer, but I don't. Uh, and then the last cue I want to talk about is purposeful gazing, which is eye contact. And I'm pretty sure your parents taught you you need to make eye contact. And they are right. The key when you do it virtually is that eye contact now is with the camera. So I'm guessing you've probably figured this out by now, but when I'm speaking, when we're talking to someone virtually, we need to be looking at the camera. So I'm looking at my little green dot. It might be red or orange or yellow for you, but I'm looking and I'm speaking to you because I want us to be having eye contact that builds connection. So see if you can see the difference here. So if I'm talking to you now, hopefully you feel like I'm really looking at you. If I'm looking at different parts of the screen, it becomes more obvious. And this is when people are looking at phones or someone comes in where we start to feel like there's some distraction. Okay, so a sticky note behind that camera, a picture, something to remind you, that is a great thing. What I still see happening pretty frequently, however, is people are not putting their devices at eye, at eye level. So you will see things like this, where they have their laptop literally in their lap, um, or often like phones. They'll have their phone, um, they're holding down and they're speaking this way. The difficulty with this is it feels like someone is looking down at you. So it doesn't feel good. It feels negative. That the expression looking down their nose at you, looking down at you, that's for a reason. It has a negative connotation. It feels like condescension, like arrogance. So you want to make sure um, that you're putting things at eye height. And then frankly, oh my gosh, I have had way too many conversations with nostrils <laughs> where you're just looking up someone's nose. Um, and it it highlights my double chin like. It's just not a flattering angle. So I would like you to consider moving your device to eye height. So that might mean putting it on books, um, buying a riser, just thinking about the level and um, it should be at the, at the height you would normally be speaking at. Okay. The other thing is people, people often get too close. So as I'm speaking now, I'm literally, I'm over an arm's length away. This is what I would be in real life. I want to respect your personal bubble. And normally people need about a foot and a half to three feet to feel good. So I wanna respect like that foot and a half buffer that we have. If, um, okay, get ready for this. If I start talking like this, it starts, <laughs> starts to feel a little scary. Like, ah, I'm in your space because, because I'm invading that bubble. I see this quite a bit with phones where people just, they're talking really close on their phones. So check yourself. Make sure you're giving the nonverbal respect by keeping, by, you know, um, observing proxy mix is the fancy word. All right. Lighting and uh, microphones, like vocal, vocal tone. These are two things. Um, we've, we're almost two years into things now where we're doing much more virtually. You need to consider your lighting. So it is in the evening right now. I've made sure that I'm well lit. I actually have some soft box lights. I look really fancy. They were like $80. So a little bit expensive, but I wanna make sure I'm well lit during the day, during the afternoon and in the evening that people can see me. So make sure that you've given that consideration. And the reason I have like the, the, like the soft box lights, uh, ring, ring um, lights aren't good with glasses. So. I thought, well, it's, ring lights are about the same price, so I'm gonna just opt for these other ways of lighting myself. Your uh, microphone and your device is probably fine, but if you're on a fair amount of calls, you might wanna consider investing because vocal tone is, this is like a deal breaker. If people are cutting in and out or you can't hear them well virtually, we, you typically have to reschedule. It is that imperative that we have good vocal tone. And there's a lot of different price points. I have one of the cheaper models. I have um, this cute little snowball microphone here. Uh, so consider if that is something, if you're on a fair amount of calls, you might wanna invest in that as well. 
And then I just want to highlight backgrounds that you can give some weight to what how you're showing up. You can use a, a changing screen. I've actually heard about shower curtains, tapestries. Just think about how you are showing up. I've, I'm very intentional. I have speech bubble bookshelves and I have um, a hello there sign. I'm trying to non-verbally say, I talk about communication and I'm friendly. So we can be really intentional about how we want to show up. Now, uh, Lisa and Don and I were strategic tonight. So Lisa has a blurred background. Don has a curtain and I have a real background. The science says that people prefer real because it gives you a little bit of a, a slice of who the person is. You're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know they had a deer head or whatever it might be. Um, here, I'm going to just go to myself here. Uh, so people prefer that, but curtains are, 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 are just plain backgrounds are good or the, um, the virtual backgrounds are okay, except for the pixelated part, people don't like that. Now, Lisa, I'm gonna have you unblur because Lisa has uh, a rotary banner from her years as president. And she has mentioned that that is a great conversation starter. She'll often have this on a call and people will comment on it. So that is something to consider too. Is there a picture or something that helps you kind of lead into a conversation? For me, it's my bookshelves. People will typically comment on them and I can, I can um, build from there. So I am going to end there. I went over a minute. Um, we can talk more. I, if you want to take a screenshot, if you have more questions and want to connect with me, you certainly can. But we're going to be sticking around anyway, so you can ask your questions there. So it is, I'm sending it over to... Back to me. Uh, back to and Lisa. Lisa, feel free to drop your contact info in the chat as well. Sure. Would be wonderful. All right, let's jump on back. So a big thank you to Don and Kristen for sharing. And everything's looking good to you, Don, I assume? That is correct. Fantastic. OK. Um, preparation honors your audience. In her address at Mega Pets last year, Rotary International President-elect Jennifer Jones said, preparation honors your audience. I can't stress that enough. While we're all volunteers, right? And you, you saw tonight, nothing's perfect, but we do aspire to create the most professional learning experience possible. So I am going to share with you um, some documents, some resources that we have available for you on the District 6270 website. So, Don is going to drop a link into the chat if he hasn't already to our to this page. But if you go to 6270 and click on our meeting request from the right hand side of the screen, it'll take you to this page. So I wanted to take a moment and tell you a little bit about the resources that we have available for you. Um, the, in, I have them in the red box there in your lower left corner. The top one is an event planning guide. And I saw some comments in the chat at the start of the session that that is something people are looking for. So yay, we have a resource for you. The planning guide document provides an overview to creating and executing an event, including who to contact for support and a timeline. So this is a multi-page document. You can download it from the 6270 website and use it really as your guide guide to think through your content decisions, your promotional decisions, who you need, what resources, do you want a survey created, do you need the Zoom host key, all of those um, items are in that document to help you plan a successful event. Then the next document down, the planning timeline calculator, is really the companion. This is simply an Excel file that when you enter the date of your event, it's going to calculate your milestones so that you stay on track in your preparation. So those are, are really nifty documents for you. Again, please download it, rename it and make it your own. And then the final document that you'll, the third document that you'll see is my favorite. It's not a surprise. It's the day of template. This is really your planning spreadsheet for during the event itself. So in our pull back the curtain spirit, 
In just a moment, I will share the template we're using for tonight. The last two items you'll see are RI's PowerPoint template to ensure that you are branding your event appropriately and a link to the district calendar to help you in selecting dates. So if it's one of your responsibilities to reserve the date, find a good spot so we don't have so many events in a single week or not overlapping with something else happening in the district. So that's where your resources are located on the 6270 website, just one click in for you. Next, here it is. Pull back the curtain. Here's the spreadsheet that we used for tonight's session. It all starts with the time start. You see that six o'clock in the red box in that upper left corner? This is beautiful. You type in the start time of your event, and then you start entering the activities. And you'll see across we have minutes and then activity, stage manager, and resources to share. So I did the welcome introduction session overview. We planned four minutes for that. You know I didn't talk for four minutes, but you know how Zoom is. We started a minute, minute and a half late. So I built that in. But I typed in four minutes and it told me that that would go until 6.04 and it automatically calculates all of the times for you in the far too left columns. Something else that we're doing here, stage manager activities, who's doing what? So you'll see that the spotlighting that's really important for user experience that Don talked about, we have our instructions in here as to who's spotlighting who and when, and when we're opening, when we're sharing, et cetera, on down the line. So you'll see that we are now at 643 and we should be in Q&A already. So we are running just a couple minutes behind and we did start a couple minutes late. Uh, but we'll catch up here momentarily. So these are the planning resources that we have. You see in that resources to share, you'll notice that those are links that we shared with you during the session. We dropped them into chat for folks who want to just grab it and save it right away. And these tools will also be shared with you in the follow-up email we send once we have the video ready to share. So that's a sneak peek at what it looked like for tonight. And you can see what we have left. We are going to take this right to Q&A, and then we'll have a menti poll, and then we will look at wrapping up. So I am going to open it for questions. I will stop sharing. And we are ready. And thank you so much, Kristen, for dropping your website there. That is fantastic. Um, now it's your time. We have, we have 15, 16 minutes remaining. Carl's asking, what camera is Kristen using? So it's eCam. It's a little e and then C-A-M-M. -M. But it, it's for, for Mac users. If not, I think I saw someone put in there the OBS. Pete okay. did. Thank you, Pete. Actually, Chris and I was wondering what the the actual physical camera is that you have because it's also a very high quality. It, it actually is. I'm just using my device. Really? I know. Wow. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> and I'll I'll take this moment to comment. A couple of you had talked about gestures and cultural differences. So, uh, very good. Yeah, that um, we want like emblems, like thumbs up. A-OK, -okay, those are different, there's different cultural implications. So you do wanna know your audience, who you're speaking to. And eye contact, so virtually, or in person, I should say, you're right, there's different cultures. We, our family hosts a lot of exchange students and we have hosted students from countries where it's, it's respectful not to look directly at you. Uh, so being mindful of that, you're, you're correct. But if you're trying to simulate eye contact, you need to be looking at that camera. Thanks, Carl. And thank you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Looking for additional questions. And if someone wants to you know, raise hand, unmute and ask, that is terrific as well. Or you can drop them into the chat. And I, I received a question about, um, is there a way to present, uh, prevent chat from uh, popping up on the screen during a presentation because yeah and because it can be uh be distracting and it, i i there there's two parts to that answer for if it's within the zoom meeting that you know that that chat window that's just going to kind of keep going and if, if you're one of those that squirrel uh yes it's going to be very very distracting um 
if it's something that, you know, I've got uh, a Mac as well, and my wife sends me a text message, it pops up on my screen. The key there is to kill, app, to kill off all of the apps that I don't need running in for this presentation. Um, because again, you know, it kind of gets back to that lag and, uh, and minimi maximizing resources. So Rob has a question. It's more a, a comment uh, on the format that uh, you showed out of the district website. Uh, we did a membership uh, um, committee presentation in the summer before it was developed. And then we did another one in the fall after it was developed and, and having used gone both ways, it's incredible how much easier it is with the, uh, the format that uh, the district has got. So I suggest, you know, that, that, you know, that should be the first place you look because it's very helpful. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to pop some emoticons on here because I appreciate that, Rob. <laughs> Um, I'm going back through and, and please continue to ask questions. Um, some of you had some questions early on. Kelly asked a great question about how do you deal with someone that's a strong participant that overpowers others. Uh, and I think that's a huge one as a facilitator, as the moderator, right? To be aware of that. Some people just share easily and you know they might make a comment or two, but then as a facilitator, prefacing with, let's hear from someone we haven't heard from yet. Right, and then inviting someone else to share can help. Um, in breakouts, you know, giving some instruction to your facilitators as well might be helpful in that regard too. Prefacing it with, we want to hear from multiple, we want we have multiple voices in our process and make sure that we're inviting that um, can be huge. Um, Sarah asked a great question about how do you get people to, uh, you know, her fear is when I ask a question and no one responds. Absolutely. You know, I come from the education world and sometimes you have to wait it out, right? And people might need the think time. You know, you know, you're going to ask that question. The audience didn't know it was coming. So you saw at the beginning of the session, I waited. It took about 10, 15 seconds, which honestly feels like a lifetime as the speaker, as the presenter. But all of a sudden they find they just started popping in. Right. If you are really fearful that no one is going to ask or contribute, the other option is to seed a question or two in the audience. Right. So have one or two friends at the ready. Um, and a Angie's nodding because we've done this together before. Have a couple of questions preset because, again, it's the first time the audience is hearing it and they might need some think time before they're ready to, to ask or to contribute have someone else there and ready to get the conversation started. Have a friend in the audience. Uh, Don or Kristen, anything you want to add to any of the questions that you have seen along the way? No, I'll just I, add. Uh, oh, go ahead, Kristen. <laughs> no. I'll just add that often when I'm presenting, if people aren't responding, I'll say, well, a question I often get, or I'll just, I'll have something kind of prepared to uh -huh. um, get things going. What you might be wondering about. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, Angie, yes. do you have a yes, question? Yeah. Um, two things. Uh, Kristen, you mentioned how looking around and so forth might be perceived as you're not paying attention. And I'm challenged by that because quite honestly, in order to hardwire things in my brain, I write, I take notes. And it's not as much that I'm ever even going to possibly look at those notes again. It's just that that's how it goes into my brain. And you know, I've had people say, well, you're going to get the deck anyway. I'm like, that's not how I learn. So how can I be respectful of the presenter so they don't think I'm not paying attention when I'm actually paying a lot of attention? Right. So I, owning it, saying I'm, I process best when I take notes. So if you see me looking down, I'm, I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes. And I've literally, I've even had web trainings where the speaker will look down and say, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. I, I want to take a look at my notes. Great. So just sort of acknowledge it. Maybe a private message, a chat to them. Sure. Sure. Let them know sure. that. Okay. Okay. So many the, yeah. the other thing would be very quickly, um, what I've noted is when there's going to be breakout rooms and you know, you're going to do breakout rooms for conversation, discussion. If you can indeed send those questions out at registration, 
people like my husband who doesn't let anything come out of his mouth so it's all thought out and he knows that's exactly what he thinks and believes he'll look at it and he'll use it where people like me go on the fly um, and don't need to know those questions but in order to respect those other folks and have their voice it's really good if you can let them know those questions or discussion items ahead of the session absolutely angie and you're, you're going right back to the the what why how that we talked about what are you hoping to accomplish during the session you know if it's information sharing it's one but if it's a work session and you want that contribution coming forward sharing that in advance you know here's the pre-work please read this article review the agenda ponder this topic so that folks are ready to pop in absolutely um i think we had a question on how do you spotlight from irma and if you are a host or co-host you can do that from the three dots in the right upper right corner of the photo or from the participant list so super easy if you are the host you have the keys to do that um, and you can do that quite easily looking for others carl says just last week zoom included a feature where you can show powerpoint into the breakout rooms very useful for instruction absolutely thank you uh diane has a question i Is don't see it. oh there we go here i am here i am um if i am presenting and i need to um have notes in front of me mm -hmm. i tend to work with two screens so sometimes i'll have my notes on one screen and the you know, the camera's on the other screen. But of course, people can tell that I'm not looking at them. So is there, with all the technology out there, is there a way to put the notes on the screen below your camera or somewhere? You know, what? Clipboard yes. or what? What do we do? There, there is. And that's what I was using tonight. So I have what I was showing you on my second monitor. And then I have PowerPoint open in presentation mode. So I had notes adjacent to the slide. So it was on the monitor that's directly in front of me. But that's something we can certainly do a, a, a quick Zoom one-on-one, -on -one, Diane, if you'd like to take a look at that yeah. um, or also share some resources. Actually, and I'll make a note, Don, we should include that in our follow-up resources that we send. Okay. We can do a help item on how to do that. Thank you. It's always a little nerve wracking to know, are they seeing my notes or are they seeing what I intended? So I did some done. How are we looking good <laughs> to ensure that everyone was seeing what I expected them to see? So Linda's, uh, Linda's got a good, great question. Are there any special presentation tips if you're presenting in a hybrid session live in Zoom? And very appropriate because we're doing that next week in, in Illinois. <laughs> Yes, we are doing that at PETS. We have President Deluxe who will be joining us in person and those who will be joining us virtually. Uh, and I think it's a great question. Linda will be together and working on that as well. Um, the key to remember is you have two audiences and they're both important. You can't get caught up with just the folks in the room or just the folks on screen. I realize that's easier said than done, um, but how you, how you can mix up the groups or use Menti where everyone is contributing to the output of it, regardless of where they're coming from. Uh, but I think hybrid is probably our next training topic is how we maximize that learning environment coming really soon. Kim says, I use my phone as a second screen so I can gauge how the presentation looks on mobile. Yes, you can do that as well. So good tips. Um, I, as a I, reminder, I, oh, go ahead, Don. I was going to, I did also want to loop back. One of the things that we're going to be doing for uh, the breakout sessions uh, at PETS is I'm taking advantage of being able to have multiple cameras being input to Zoom. So we're gonna be able to have Mike be the main focus, but if somebody in the room asks a question, we could, we're gonna be able to switch to, that, to a different camera and focus in on that individual focusing on, on asking the question. If somebody is asking a question in Zoom, obviously they're gonna take up the screen. Mm -hmm. So, uh we've we've got i've got a working theory uh pete lisa and i will get to put that in practice next week 
Absolutely. And Don and I happen to be members of the same club, the Oshkosh Downtown Club. And when we were in a hybrid mode, we would have someone with their phone walking the room so that if someone had a comment or a question, it was, they were more involved and it was being shared. So I think we are at 6.57. It's time to go to our mentee, right, Don? And then again, we will stay on until 7.15 for any additional questions that you might have. But let's go ahead with doing a bit of feedback. Um, I love the Menti tool. As Don said, it is um, a little easier to use than Zoom polling. Not that Zoom isn't effective, but you don't have to have it have access to Zoom in advance. So we have two questions for you as we close. I'm going to encourage you to, if you have that secondary device close by, um, grab a cell phone or an iPad. Otherwise, you can just open another browser on your computer and go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and you will be prompted for a code, which is on the screen. But if you had to go to another browser and you don't see it, I shall read it for you. It is 9582-3507. That's 9582-3507. So we are using the, the floating technique in Menti. Um, and I'm asking that you share, did you have a key takeaway tonight, an aha moment? What did you find most interesting, maybe most useful, most impactful? Like, I'm gonna try this next time. Uh, so go ahead and give us your feedback there. And it will build for us as Don refreshes the screen periodically. And here's where you have to be just a little bit patient when you use Menti, uh, because of, again, that lag Don talked about, right? So OBS Studio, fantastic, a new tool. Love it. And these will start popping in. So menti.com 9582-3507. Yeah, that the tools were right on the district website. Yay. Fantastic. Yes. Those are there to help and support you. And Don and I are available as well. We are an email away. We can schedule a quick Zoom. And oh, great. Teaching a class on this subject next month and tips and camera lighting sound are valuable. Great. Optimal distance from the camera. Making sure they can see your hands, right? Trust indicators, the timeline, tools. We like Menti, the district website, website, wonderful. Looking at feature that allows you to unmute participants. Okay, great, thank you. Keep them coming. Presentation, uh, a preparation honors your audience. I have to tell you, you know how you, you go to different sessions and say, if I get one great takeaway or idea, I'm gonna be thrilled. This literally has been on my bulletin board in my office since Jennifer Jones said it a year ago. That quote, those are my words to live by. Preparation, right? And we can't stress enough that once you have that, temp, that timeline built is you rehearse, right? You get together with your participants and do tech rehearsal, just like if it were theater. Uh, Making what, sure you know where the, these transitions happen. Go ahead, Don. One of the things that I wanted to comment about showing hands on screens, uh, after Kristen gave us, uh, did a presentation about that, I started really making sure that I got my <laughs> hands up in, this, in the screen. Well, I've got an Apple Watch and I emote enough with my, with my hands that I can be on an hour presentation and I will get my stand, my stand credit. So <laughs> there's always that. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I should share as well this Menti tool, and the, the website is actually mentimeter.com to set them up, it has polling and has other options as well. I love this because one of the things we're going to do is we are going to download this, and it'll, this will be part of your follow-up email. So you're going to get a copy of what everyone else's key takeaways were. It might be a nice little motivator, inspiration, thought-provoking. So I think we'll go to our second question, Don. What do you still want to learn more about? Don and I are here, and, and Pete and Mike, we're here to serve the Rotarians and Rotaractors in the district. What's next? What would you like to have shared forward to help you doing the good work that you do for Rotary? So what's next? What else is on your mind?
Definitely hybrid meetings, yes. And we'd have some resources on that from a technical standpoint, but I think we're at the point now where we're getting more into the engagement and the flow of those things. So great. Use other platforms for presentations, hybrid and breakouts, balancing the demands. It's not easy, is it? How to make sure the people on Zoom and a hybrid can hear when you are showing a video. Ah, there is a setting for that. You actually need to optimize it for video and sound before you share. So that is a key thing in using Zoom. When you actually hit the share screen, you have to select that option before you share your content. More sophisticated connections and presentations to better audience relationships. Okay. How to be more concise. Cheat sheets do help. Yes. Using self. For questions, does phone audio pick up? I'm not sure if I'm following the question if someone else or wants to unmute by all means. Still learning how to organize my email box with filters and folders for each topic so I don't get overwhelmed. Oh, there's an interesting question with unsorted email. Good stuff. Thank you everyone for your terrific contributions here. Again, Dr. feel free to keep adding. Yes, please. And this, I hope, uh, I just want to say I'm starting to navigate that whole hybrid thing now, too, where I've gone to a few organizations and presented in person, but they have the hybrid option. So I'm still figuring that out. I'd love to attend your, your meeting on that, your next session. But I have learned uh, figuring out what the camera can pick up so I know where to stay so people can see me. And then throughout the presentation, checking in. And if you have the luxury of someone that's kind of running the tech, fantastic. But saying, you know, we're not forgetting about you, um, to, you know, those of you that are, are participating virtually or are virtual um, participants, what, what are your thoughts on this? Is that making sense? Trying to describe um, things that when um, trying to have a, a camera that faces the audience too, that's another thing I've learned that that helps people see what other people are doing in the audience, cool. the learning curve. Yes, absolutely. When I'm teaching, I typically go to my virtual participants first, right? And yeah. they're on the screen behind and, and ask if they have questions or input from there and then come to the audience in the room. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I love this. Great. You've given, You've given me great input on what we can bring to you next, which is absolutely fantastic. And I need to pop over to the chat to see if we have a survey link we can share with folks. We do have a quick survey monkey survey that we are going to share. It will also be in the email follow-up, but if you like to answer the questions quickly, you can grab that and complete that now. I think at this time, I'm just going to say just Huge thank you to Kristen Bach for joining us tonight. And if you haven't already, Kristen, please drop your contact info in the chat and to Don Griffin and to all of you for taking the time and sharing and asking such great questions as we are navigating this world together and all collaborating to make our training as good as we can and as meaningful to the students, the, the attendees that we serve. So thank you to everyone. And if you would like to stay on, we are keeping it open for about another 10 minutes. You're welcome to stay and ask your questions directly. So on behalf of 6270, thank you all for joining us and have a fantastic night.